afternoon. Welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. These are your headlines for Monday, December 10th, 2012. Gold rises, said some headlines today, citing Italian technocrat Prime Minister Mario Monti's plans to resign, also expectations of Fed easing. Regardless, it was actually barely up. So why has the yellow metal been trading sideways for pretty much the past year and a half as the S&P 500 has gained a very respectable 25 percent? We'll hear from commodities legend Eric Sprott about that and about silver, too. Plus, U.S. and U.K. regulators have reportedly published a joint paper. They wrote about it on the pages of the, the op-ed pages, rather, of the Financial Times to deal with two big-to-fail banks that need to, well, fail. It's the first cross-border plan. It includes losses for shareholders, removing senior management, and converting debt into equity to provide capital. Now, capital is one solution to mitigate the liability of massive credit expansion. If only we had hard money, though. We'll break that down for you in Word of the Day. And while we're on all that glitters, check out this trip to the vault. It's enormously impressive, but it's a bit sad, rather like a mausoleum where the, the dead gold is sitting waiting for people to remember it. Kind of a funny video. You'll never guess where that was. We'll tell you and have more in Loose Change. Let's get to today's capital account. Plenty of news events, like some I mentioned in headlines, to create uncertainty in this economy, to send investors running to safe havens. And an asset we've seen react in the past, gold, sure it's up a little today, but looking back, it's nothing like this tear it was on. Gold has traded at another record, $1,645 an ounce. And gold posted a new record high at $1,815 an ounce. And the one place people are going is gold. Gold is trading solidly above $1,800 an ounce. It's now up more than 50% in the last year. Remember all that? That was in the summer of 2011 surrounding the U.S. debt ceiling debate and the downgrade. And gold even topped $1,900 an ounce at some point way up here. Well, you can see it's come down from there. And it's pretty much where it was uh, about a year ago, despite the types of continued news events that would drive investors to it. Not to mention, according to the World Gold Council, central banks will buy more than 500 tons of gold this year. That's up from 465 tons in 2011 a new high. So what's happened there? And the recent period aside, which we just addressed, we'll get to that, you can see what preceded that was more than a decades long, decade long really, bull market in gold, okay? What we can't see behind this though is how much of this has been driven by the types of factors that we talk about every day, okay? QE, debt downgrades. That versus how much is driven by issues such as the 20-year bear market in gold that preceded this run with the structural changes of supply that happened over a very long period of time, forcing the inevitable price adjustment that we're perhaps seeing today. So earlier I spoke to Eric Sprott, CEO of Sprott Asset Management, and started by asking how he's weighed those factors over the years. Here's what he said. When I first got in gold, involved in gold in a serious manner, which was 2000, essentially right at the bottom of the market, I was uh, sort of guided by a book written by um, a gentleman who called the 1998 Gold Book. His, his name is Frank Veneroso. And he surmised, sort of ghetto like, that uh, the central banks had been supplying the market and suppressing the price of gold. Mm -hmm. And his conclusion was that there really was more demand than supply already back in 1998 of 800 tons a year. And of course, the point of reference is the size of the gold market, which is about 4,000 tons. And I thought, you know, I think he's probably got a point here. Looks to me like there's more demand than supply. And so that's what brought me into gold. That and the fact that I, I felt very much like we were going into a bear market well before the NASDAQ peaks. And there's only one way to survive in, a, in that market, and that's to own real assets. So those two things were kind of my guiding principle. Uh, we have been aided and abetted along the way 
by the financial crisis mm -hmm. and the reaction to the financial crisis, the mm -hmm. things you were mentioning, quantitative easings, uh, conservatorships, uh, LTROs, uh, just massive money printing to save the financial system, uh, two bank runs, which would cause people to go to gold. So these have all created tailwinds uh, that make one believe that the price of gold can still go many times higher than it is today. Okay, so then let's talk about, because I want to ask what's changed in the landscape and the dynamics perhaps in the last year and a half, because in the summer of 2011, following the U.S. debt downgrade, of course the Eurozone crisis was still a major concern, and every day it seemed like gold was hitting a new record. I can remember just watching it and reporting on it and going, whoa, what is going on? I mean, it went from 1600 to 1900 in less than three weeks, and now in this past year and a half, gold just hasn't moved much. What has changed? Right. Well, uh, you have to be kind of circumspect about what might really be happening here. And it, it, it happens to be my view that when the crises are evident, the powers that be do not want the crisis to be evident. And knowing that the gold and silver are, in essence, the canary in the gold mine, I think there is pressure brought to bear on gold prices. And, Lauren, we recently, about three months ago, issued a report saying, are asking the question, do these Western central banks have any gold left? And we asked that question because our own analysis showed that on average, the we, we can see a net increase in demand from 2000 to today of about 2,500 tons a year. Mm -hmm. And if you could possibly accept that we might have had an 1,800 ton shortage back in 2000, we now have a 4,300 ton shortage in a 4,000 ton market. And you have to ask yourself, well, where is the gold coming from for all these new entrants? As you pointed out, there have been lots of changes in the last year. Think of the huge demand that's happened uh, in uh, China. Mm -hmm. uh, think of the huge change in central bank buying that's gone on, non-Western central bank buying. Mm -hmm. And this, the gold market's a market where the supply's been flat for 12 or 13 years now. So how do you how do you have new entrants come into a gold market that's been in balance for 12 years? Mm -hmm. And I, I can only imagine that central banks have continued to lease gold uh, into the market to keep the price under control. So you're suggesting and, and you think the key factor here is that central banks are essentially manipulating the gold price and that's what's suppressing the price right now? I believe that central banks are continuing to lease gold into the market. So we've seen examples recently where, you know, they asked the Bundesbank, well, where's our gold? And yeah. I think they had 17% in Germany and they didn't really know where, well, they didn't, said they knew where the rest was. But of course, we don't know what's happened to that gold that might be in London or New York. And I, probably the most revealing thing is when the Austrian bank was asked where our gold was, and of course it was in London and New York, and the, the then, I think, finance minister said, but we're earning income on uh, leasing the gold. Mm -hmm. And of course, I can. When you lease gold, the physical gold disappears. Mm -hmm. And you know, if somebody wanted the gold back that we bought in our gold trust, or that the Chinese bought, or that the Indians bought. You're not going to get it back. Mm -hmm. So I think these these central banks are living in some kind of world where they think, oh well, we'll just phone up, you know, our bullion bank and ask for the gold back that they're going to get it. And I I think that that gold is long gone. Wow. Well, then, do you think just thinking about the price, do you think that? still the price will come down from where it was in those highs in 2011 and still has further to go, uh, driven by some I, of these factors you're talking about? Or do you think it's going to head up from here? Well, Lauren, as I said in the write-up, do they have any, any gold left to sell? I mean, mm -hmm. there was a time back in 2000 when we thought they might have had, I think it was 32,000 tons. Uh, the Benarosa work suggested that might already be down to 18,000 tons. We've identified as much as 2,500 tons a year of excess selling. I got to believe there can't be that much left in the system. So uh, do I expect the price to go up? Yes, I do. It's gone up for 12 years in a row. It's up pretty nicely this year. Uh, I think there's a real valid reason for the central banks to try to limit the price of gold. Because obviously their policies uh, verge on the Ponzi here when you just end up buying all of your country's debt, whether you're Japan or the U.S. or, or England. <clears throat> and those of us who would watch us would look for some tell mm -hmm. as to whether the system is buying into it or not. And we all know the tell would be the price of gold and silver. And they don't want the tell to be read. Mm -hmm. In other words, 
if, if we all saw the price of gold and silver hitting new highs, I think we'd realize that the policies of the central planners were likely to cause hyperinflation. Okay, so then let, let me ask you more about the central planners, because they do seem that they have been effective in some regards in, in, in doing what they want to achieve. So in the same time that we're talking about where gold has really come down uh, or kind of stayed the same, in the same place, uh, September, September 22nd, excuse me, of 2011, the S&P 500 has risen 25%. So we're here in year four after 2008. Many would argue the fundamental problems that got us into the 2008 crisis have not been addressed. So does this prove that not only can the Fed can keep equity prices higher, but that maybe if you're an investor sitting there and you're looking at this and you're saying, you know, I just missed this rally, maybe the Fed and central banks really can keep equity prices higher. And if they're committed to doing so, which they certainly seem to be, shouldn't I just get in? Do you think people are sitting there saying this now? Well, I think, Lauren, what you have to do is you have to look at the long-run impact again, and who knows when it finally breaks. But, I mean, I look at uh, the Fed buying, let's say, 90 percent of the bonds is totally ludicrous. Uh, the Japanese probably buying more than 100 percent of their bonds. It's, it's grossly impractical. And, of course, the result of these, these purchases is to drive interest rates almost to nothing. But it's an artificial rate. It's not where bonds should be trading, and you can't do it forever. And, you know, when the, um, when the Fed says, you know, they're going to uh, work their way out of all the bond purchases, uh, which they used to talk about, I mean, there's absolutely no way now that anyone could imagine that they would ever be able to delever their balance sheet. I think they're in it for the long run. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I think by driving interest rates lower, you have a positive tendency on stock prices. But if I think if we all think that the interest rate at 1% or 2% for bonds is ludicrous. That, in turn, causes uh, stock valuations to be ludicrous, because if we start moving up in interest rates here, mm -hmm. the whole situation in all countries, from a um, deficit perspective, starts changing markedly here, as you have to pay market interest rates on your bonds and not some illusory temporary rate. Yeah, but at the same time, let me just play devil's advocate for a moment, because the private sector is so indebted, too. So why couldn't we see Treasuries last at this level for, say, I don't know, another decade without imploding? Because private sector deleveraging could arguably continue another 10 years, and that could keep public sector debt relatively attractive. Well, I don't know that we would call public sector debt attractive. <laughs> when, when I, I, I hear you, of course. And when the central bank's buying 90 percent of it, it yeah. might be attractive to the central bank. It's obviously not attractive to the Chinese anymore, mm -hmm. and it's likely not attractive to any uh, non-Western central bank anymore, as we see most a lot of these central banks buying gold. I mean, it doesn't take much to see through uh, the long-run impact of the policy here. You, we've seen this massive change in what non Western central banks are doing in terms of diversifying their uh, their reserves out of government debt into physical things, mm -hmm. predominantly in China, but also in many other countries. So it's not a policy that anyone could imagine is sustainable here, mm -hmm. uh, not without creating some kind of serious inflation. You can't just keep printing money without there being inflation. And it's sort of come to my mind that the reason they control the price of gold and silver is that's because the first place everyone would go. They're not going to go and buy wheat and oil and other things like that. They're going to buy gold and silver. So if you keep the price of gold and silver controlled, mm -hmm. you probably prevent what would appear to be the start of an inflationary era. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think they leaned on gold and silver in particular. It's food for thought and still ahead. Why is Eric Sprott thrilled to learn that we don't talk about silver all that much on this show? That's ahead. Plus, which metal does he think is so last decade and which does he think is going to perform this decade? Find out after the break. But first, your closing market numbers.
You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. Soup of the day. My favorite radio guy in Fort Lauderdale is Minestrone Chicken Sausage. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. We're talking about precious metals. Before the break, we were focused on gold, but we don't want to overlook silver. Okay, I know we don't give it as much play, but it is one of Eric Sprott's fortes. So we were sure to ask him about it. And to be fair, come on, it is a lot less money out of your pocket to get into gold, or excuse me, get into silver. So, you know, does that make it a more attractive investment to say someone like me who maybe can't shell out big bucks for gold? Well, here's Eric Sprott. I have to admit, we don't actually cover silver as much as we do gold, uh, but I know it's one of your specialties. I actually think I've heard you say you're more bullish about silver. Obviously, I want to know why. I also want to know what are the unique factors that move this market that are completely different from gold. I know, for one, it's a lot smaller. I know that uh, with supply, a lot of it comes on from mines that aren't dedicated silver mines, and also some of it, of course, has to go to industrial use. Right. Well, Lauren, first of all, I'm very happy that you don't spend much time on silver. Oh, <laughs> well, good. I'll pat myself it's on the back. Now tell me why. <laughs> statement. It's a statement that no, people don't look at silver, right? Uh -huh. uh, we have these silver trusts, and I go around and see various people on silver and institutions, and not many people spend any time looking at silver, which I regard as a great thing, which means, you know, it can only change to the better. What are the key things that I look at in summer? And I would, I would encourage people to check out the data. I mean, if you go to the U.S. Mint website, mm. you'll find both this year and last year that the amount of dollars invested in silver and gold coins is the same. Huh. Now, there's a, there's, that makes for an interesting thing on the physical side because, as you know, the price is trading at 53 to 1 mm -hmm. ratio, mm -hmm. which means we're buying 53 times more silver than gold. For investment purposes, 53. Wow. The available of silver for investment versus gold for investment is a ratio of seven to one, is what you can put in. But people are buying it 50 to one. When we issue our silver trust, which we just closed on a deal, we raised 320 million in the last tranche of our silver deal. The previous tranche of our gold deal, which is about two months ago, we raised 349 million. Mm -hmm. Let's just say for all intents and purposes, it was about the same. In other words, we bought 50 times more silver for mm -hmm. investment purposes than we did gold. Mm -hmm. Well, all I can tell you is when it's available seven for one, we, the investor can't keep buying it at 50 to one mm -hmm. before something happens. Okay, interesting. It's so then I, I do want to ask though, because like I said, we talk about gold, but for people that watch this show who perhaps aren't the more well-endowed investors in our audience, uh, but they may want to own precious metals. They may think silver is a more affordable way to do so. But I also know that silver is very volatile, or at least it has been. So is this a good type of investment for the type of person who wants to own precious metals but can't afford to buy gold or not because there are these other factors that make it volatile? Right. Well, you know, there's lots of factors that make it volatile, including all the paper trading. Mm -hmm including potential manipulation of the silver price. There's lawsuits that are filed that yeah. anyone can go and read about manipulation of the silver price in 2008. There's a CFTC investigation where one of the commissioners said there's obvious evidence that there might be fraudulent activity going on in the silver market. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, you might say, well, maybe those markets I'm looking at that are as volatile as they are needn't be that volatile. Uh, I would only say this. I think uh, silver will be the investment of this decade, whereas gold was the investment of the last decade. Hmm. Silver has outperformed gold. It's more volatile, however. 
And I kind of take a long-term view on these things. If I was to give people advice, what do you do with your money? I believe that silver will trade down to a 16 to 1 ratio to gold. So let's imagine that two years from now, gold's uh, $3,000. That would imply that the price of silver could almost be $200. So your return would be 300% more if you have the patience and can stomach the volatility. I think silver will be by far the better investment going forward. We'll leave it there with Eric Sprott, CEO of Sprott Asset Management. for Word of the Day, where we break down a financial term for our smart viewer, but just not the expert. And given all this talk about precious metals with Eric Sprott, we thought we'd break down hard money, sometimes referred to as sound money. Now, we've heard hard money referred to in many different ways. Here's just one example. Unlike Bernanke, Volcker is a hard money king dollar central banker, probably the greatest central banker in our recent history. But what does it mean that Volcker is a hard money central banker? And is that an oxymoron? Well, first, let's take a look at what hard money means, okay? It's money that's backed by a hard, tangible, lasting material so as to retain its relative value over time, thus acting as a reliable store of value. So it's, you know, it's pretty intuitive. For example, before 1971, the U.S. dollar was redeemable for a set quantity of gold. This meant the dollar was sound or sounder currency, certainly, than it is now. Now, advocates of of a gold standard or some other form of commodity-based hard currency point to the huge growth in debt. Take a look at that, total public debt, <laughs> as well as other liabilities as a direct consequence of having money that isn't tied to anything tangible and whose value fluctuates with the whims of you know who, central bankers. This is otherwise known as, of course, fiat currency. Now, in a world of sound money, debts that cannot be repaid will not be repaid, and thus write-downs and bankruptcies must occur, and debts cannot simply be papered over through this, money printing and inflation. Now, even Thomas Jefferson, to go back a while, in the 1780s, wrote about the need for understanding the value of the dollar. He said, if we determine that a dollar shall be our unit, we must then say with precision, what a dollar is. And in the 1700s, after Rhode Island issued vast amounts of unbacked paper money, George Washington wrote to the former deputy governor of Rhode Island and said, paper money has had the effect in your state that it will ever have to ruin commerce, oppress the honest and oppress the honest and open the door to every species of fraud and injustice. So it really just does show how far we've come, where now in the world of fiat money, a hawkish policymaker at a central bank like Volcker is referred to as a hard money central banker. And that, my friends, is hard money. Let's wrap up with loose change. Dimitri, we can delve more into this fun video that we showed mm -hmm. at the beginning of our show. Have you ever wondered what $315 billion in gold bullion looks like? Well, uh, a certain chemistry professor, his name is Martin Polyakov, visited the gold vault at the Bank of England. How did he get that? How did he get that access to find out? Here's a look. I've never seen so much gold. In fact, I've never seen so much of any element. So we're standing here, and each shelf here has got a ton of gold, which is worth 35 million pounds at today's price. So $56 million, not taking up a lot of space. I'm just so impressed that this guy got access to the Bank of England. When do you think we'll see this in the New York Fed? <laughs> well, I Never. Well, I don't know. I mean, they did have that fake audit. <clears throat> you know, Ron Paul wanted like a real legitimate audit, and then yeah. they got a partial audit. They might do something like that. I know there are a lot of people out there that have vast suspicions about uh, how much gold is in the vaults, but I don't think the issue is if the physical gold is, is, is there in the sense it's that there is... If it's leased well, the, out to And us. also, how many times has... How many people own 
or have believe that they own the claim to a certain gold bar with that right. serial number. Right. How many times has it been rehypothecated? Right. So that's the kind of the the question with gold. They, there are still games that can be played with paper gold, and that's the that's what Gata harps on about all the time. Yeah. Bill okay. Murphy, Chris Powell, those guys right. are going to be on. Next week, by the way, they're going to be in studio, guys, together. So, right, get yeah. excited. What I think was amazing because I haven't actually ever been in a gold vault, which I would like to. I mean, it's definitely on my bucket list. Maybe one day I'd like to own one, um, but or own some gold in one at least. But I thought it was very interesting that I didn't realize that gold doesn't tarnish, it doesn't corrode. I mean, it stays in the pristine condition for years. Well, that's why decades, it's like such good money for... because it's it's it you, uh, it has all the basic quantities of money and it's divisible so you can always break it down into infinitesimally smaller quantities. And no, it doesn't. So all the gold that's ever mined in existence is still around today, which is why every time new supply grows, it's just tacked onto this giant cube that we have globally, mm -hmm. which is like I forget how many 173 Thousand uh, tons or something? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there's four thousand tons of supply, a lot, right? A lot, but no, still nothing to match up with the amount of paper liabilities out there. Yeah. Speaking of paper liabilities, mm -hmm. uh, it's not just fiat currency. I mean, other liabilities. We have food stamps. We have government entitlement entitlements. And as the U.S. unemployment rate improves, as we've seen in recent months, <sighs> take a look at this other trend: the amount of Americans becoming eligible for food stamps has increased to a record. 47.7 million Americans. Manton is one of a record 46 million Americans now on food stamps, an increase of 20 million people since the Great Recession in 2007. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, 41 percent of food stamp recipients live in households where someone does earn a paycheck, the so-called working poor. And the very sad part about the recent data we got from the USDA is that while we've been somewhat excited or, or seen an excited reaction to some of the recent non-farm payroll numbers that have come out from the BLS, uh, which show, you know, some decent job creation, that pales in comparison to the number of people that have been added to the food stamp rolls. That is scary. So it's very alarming because it really gives this completely dismaying picture that is totally at odds with any optimism about 100,000 jobs created when you're adding 600,000 people to food stamps in the same period of time. I agree, and I think we're out of time, Lauren. I'm not going to try to step on your toes on this one. <laughs> okay, well, then, then we'll leave it there because that is all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to come back tomorrow. And in the meantime, you know you can follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister. You can like our Facebook page. There it is right there. You can catch any show you miss. Catch our web exclusive, The Extra with Kevin Phillips, which we posted on Sunday. It's there at YouTube.com slash Capital Account. You know you can watch us in HD only on Hulu. There's the address, and we will see you tomorrow.